when iconic British Mark Aston Martin announces it's to create its first ever supercar, the world sits up and takes notice. Particularly as the car, the Aston Martin 177, promises to reach new levels of speed, design and price. It's the ultimate expression of what Aston Martin stands for. A project in fact so specialised that it even involves building the 177, its own mega factory. But Aston Martin is doing all this in the world's worst economic crash for 80 years. A meltdown that screams, the fun is over. This is a dramatic car creation story like no other. In 2007, Aston Martin, renowned for its understated English styling, handcrafted design, and for being James Bond's car of choice, commenced work on their most expensive production car. The cost, in excess of a million pounds sterling. The brief to build the ultimate Aston Martin. It's to be one of their most audacious decisions in their entire history. Just make the most irresistible Aston Martin. Mega factories with exclusive access follows Aston Martin over three years to compare how they take the production process to build their high-performance sports cars and push those standards to the limit as they make one of the world's most exclusive cars. We will look at how this supercar is created from its conception to the very first thoughts of its design. We've never ever taken a camera crew into here. Well, let's take a look inside. And how Aston Martin take little known ancient disciplines of order and proportion. You can actually measure the proportion of something and people will find it attractive naturally. And weave them into every part of the car. We follow the complete journey of painstakingly sculpting and wielding the supercar as well as building an engine that needs to be the most powerful of its kind ever produced. As if that challenge wasn't hard enough, just a few months after announcing production, things become a lot tougher. Over 2,000 job losses, 6,000 people were made redundant. As the London Stock Exchange crashes and with it, the British economy. This was the moment when the world thought, wow, did we lose the capitalist system? We asked the question, in light of British-based Aston Martin's decision to make the world's most expensive production car, just as the UK enters the biggest depression in a generation, how can they possibly succeed? Warwickshire, in the heart of the English countryside, is the ultra-modern home of Aston Martin, where their high-performance sports cars are made, with evocative names such as Vantage, Virage and the DB range. Overseeing the Aston Martin empire is the enigmatic CEO, Dr. Betts. Holding a doctorate in engineering, he's well aware of what's needed to get results. In general, you can say my job, my task is a complete pleasure, but it's hard work. If you enjoy hard work, it's a great pleasure. There have been three key heads of the company in its history, but it's Dr. Betts who's overseen the most successful era to date. He's also a key member of the Aston Martin race team. Very sporty, it's very, very nice to drive. And it's in racing where the company's name originates. It is in fact the combination of the founder's name, Lionel Martin, and his first race victory up Aston Hill that were brought together to create Aston Martin. And it was Dr. Ulrich Betts who gave the order for the company to move from their old premises of 40 years to Warwickshire. The move is to their spectacular brand new mega factory based at Gaydon. In total, some 29,000 square feet, housing 1,400 employees. Each car is specifically built to order, taking typically 220 man-hours. But Dr. Ulrich Betts has even bigger ideas. In this building in 2007, he turns to his team 
and asks them to contemplate an Aston Martin supercar. Director of design, Marek Reichmann, remembers it well. And Ulrich said to me, just make the most irresistible Aston Martin, something which is just, it, it is pure emotion. It's something that everyone would see and would just want to have. And as Aston Martin have a significant history to draw from, they aren't looking at a blank canvas. It stands for 94 years of history. It stands for all the, the, the passion uh, of, of the people who work on this brand and work in this car. The design is all important. It has to be traditional, drawing on almost 100 years of history, but also expected by its very nature to be radical. Marek's design team know new heights have to be met. Pushing of the boundaries, how far can we move this car on? How could we create a surface language for the car, which is still recognizable as Aston Martin, but it's an evolution of the aesthetic that we now have? Quite often, the, the team, we would spend at night developing scale model just with, with music on, no one around, the lights, the lights kind of turned off in half the building, just designing away as a team and, and feeding off each other until we came to the right car. Performance is also critical. But bizarrely, Dr. Betts is dismissive of the constraints that headline figures, such as top speed, will impose. Do not care if the car has three point something uh, seconds from zero to 100 or the maximum speed is 200 miles or 205 miles or whatever. For us, it's, it's more important what is beyond the figure. However, there is one massive restriction to be imposed, a highly limited production number. 100, too basic as a, as a figure. 50 is not enough to do a real visible effort. So it was something in between, and 77 seemed to be a, a good number. It was clear that if you do 77 cars, you can do a lot of things you cannot do for 3,000, 5,000 cars. Each owner will therefore have the chance of being able to hold one of just 77 creations. Hence, the car's name is born, the 177. The decision to make just 77 versions of the Ultima Aston Martin means specialized tooling is needed. Even the precise assembly line procedures employed to produce their range of high performance sports cars is not sufficient. So exacting is its construction that the decision is taken to build another entirely new facility housing specialized equipment and tools so that each part of the build process can be taken to a higher level. In short, Dr. Betts orders a micro mega factory. Known simply as the 177 facility, its laboratory-like setting will be the crucible of creation. So specialized is the process that Dr. Betts calculates that each car will be priced at 1.2 million pounds. A million pounds is such an unquantifiably large sum of money to pay for anything that paying it for a car means you're actually paying for something that must be more like a work of art. And in the Aston's case, you're paying for one of 77. They'll only make 77. At that point, it becomes a limited edition print. Yeah, the 177 is not just a supercar. It's, it's a piece of automotive art. And in 2007, the world of art is reaching its pinnacle of blink. British artist Damien Hirst is asking 50 million pounds for a 35-year-old man's skull, encrusted in diamonds. Indeed, world markets are running at historic highs. This were the golden noughties. Everything was shiny. Everybody had a job who wanted one. Dubai built the largest tower in the world. You know, money was everywhere. Optimism was everywhere. As buildings are scaling new heights across the globe, Aston Martin is upscaling their design capability with the construction of a mega-modern new design studio. Situated behind four-metre-high walls a metre and a half thick, it's here where all Aston Martin models are designed. Protected from the ever-present danger of industrial espionage, the company's first standalone 2,700-metre-squared design facility is extremely secure. But National Geographic is the first broadcaster to have been given access to this highly secretive inner sanctum. Head of design Marek Reichmann 
leads the way. This is the Aston Martin Design Studio. It's a very, very secretive place where all of our concept and production cars are actually developed. And no camera crew has ever been inside the studio before. So let's go in. It's very important that when we're designing, we have a tall ceiling and we have natural light. So we've got six meter spans of glass. And these rather curious lights here are actually to investigate and to, to really, really analyze the surface of the clays that we're developing in here. So they're critical to the development of the surface. This natural light gives the designer the ability to see how body lines translate in three dimensions. Right from the start, all the designers know that the dimensions of the 177 will be critical to its success. And above all, there'll be one piece of knowledge that they will try to capture in its design. We know as designers and as artists that you can measure beauty because certain proportions um, have what we call a golden section. And Leonardo da Vinci talked about this many, many times that you can actually measure the proportion of something and people will find it attractive naturally. Dating as far back as 500 BC, the golden section, as it's known, is a complex mathematical ratio of 1 to 1.618. This can be simplified as anything divided into a ratio of just over one third to just under two thirds. It's believed that this ratio has a natural beauty, a beauty that seems to be hardwired into our minds. It's defining the correct proportion um, that everyone will then look at and say, oh, I like that, and they have no idea why. For a designer, that's inherent within their brain. From the very beginning, the 177 design team used this classic formula to guide them. So when you lay down the wheelbase, you naturally know how tall the car should be, how long the overhang should be, the relationship of the glass to body. That's two thirds to one third again. So in every single theme, you would be seeing this relationship. There are many different variations of the golden section, such as the golden spiral. This is achieved by drawing a curved line from the larger to the smaller square through opposing corners. All variations are said to be golden or have divine proportions. An apt name, as these divine proportions can be found in a bewildering array of things around us. From the shape of snail shells to the form of human beings, and from the design of ancient buildings, like the Parthenon, to the patterns shaped by the heavenly swirl of the galaxies. It's been mesmerizing mathematicians and artists for centuries. With the golden section influencing their sketches, designers turn these 2D concepts into three-dimensional reality by working on a one-to-one -one basis with clay modelers in the design studio. It's very, very important that we still use our hands at Aston Martin to develop and design. One very skilled clay modeler can create the surfaces, shapes and forms very quickly from your sketches. Now the designer has the 2D image in his head, but quite often they're not able to put that into form straight away. You need a sculptor, someone who understands, ah, this is, this is the way to move and change the light on the surface. A simple, ingenious method helps compare and contrast the shapes they're trying to form. Where we're using the clay models really is to maximize ideas. So we would typically take one clay model and split it down the middle and have one theme on one side and another theme on the other side. You can look at those and say, well, I believe this is a much better line or much better suited to 177 than this line. There may be a line on the other side which is better than something on this side. So you're using those models to actually further and, and advance the design. Various models are crafted at 40% scale until the design is thought to be advanced enough to make a full-scale version. So now you're actually seeing the car at full size. And that, at that time, it's a one-off sculpture because nothing else exists. Once the clay is sculpted, a special material, Dynock, is applied. When we sculpt in clay, it's, it's quite a dull material. It doesn't have a, a lot of reflection in the surface. So we put a Dynock on the surface to make the car appear as though it's metal, the, the sculpture. Um, and that helps us read light lines, surface, and all of those things.
while the surface language of the car is being finalised, the engine is already under development. Like the designers, the engineers have some guiding principles too. Chris Porrett, one of Aston Martin's most formidable racing drivers and chief engineer for the 177, knows how engine performance will be critical to the car's success. The engine, the heart of the 177, has to be extremely powerful. At an early stage, the engineers decide to use a naturally aspirated engine. From uh, the early days of Aston Martin, they've been naturally aspirated, which is basically it uses just pure air that comes in, not compressed air that goes into the engine, and doesn't have a turbine in the exhaust system to boost performance. The extra power that systems like a turbo or a supercharger deliver can only be accessed at given speeds. In contrast, a naturally aspirated engine can draw on its raw power at any speed. So the target for the engineers is simple, to build the most powerful naturally aspirated engine in the world. For his starting point, Chris Porritt looked at the most powerful engine they'd produced to date. The design was based loosely on our V12 Vantage engine, DBS engine, it uses the original block from that, but then it goes through a number of processes that make it very different. It is, in effect, a brand new engine designed specifically for 177. The engine has an underlying characteristic, which makes it responsive at any speed. Power is the headline figure for any engine, but it's actually torque that gives you the performance of the car. We've always delivered engines with high, high torque, high specific torque. Being a large V12 engine has a very, very wide and flat torque curve, which means that the performance of the car is accessible at any speed. It accelerates very quickly from 30 miles an hour up to 200 miles an hour. An engine's torque is the physical measure of how much instant strength the engine can give. Critically, torque produces acceleration, whereas horsepower provides top speed. The trick with the 177 is that it has both. High torque combined with large horsepower. The next stage is to make an actual engine, using performance guidelines they've determined are needed. The engine then needs to be fully tested to its extremes on a machine called a dyno. Ian Minards, Director of Product Development, explains this process. Dyno testing is important because you can exercise the engine right the way through its rev and its load range without it needing to be in a car. And we've used dynos that have been uh, really placed there for F1 testing. We can mimic 220 mile an hour flat out running. We can mimic low torque, high torque. The 177 engine has much more to do with race technology than it does with road car technology. Just like the rest of the car, each of the 77 engines will be handcrafted, making everyone in some way unique. We're taking a solid lump of aluminium, machining away large chunks of that billet to create the form. You can see how the part has been machined, where the cutter has moved through this billet of aluminium and carved out this part. While the engines are being created, in the design studio, the shape of the car is being finalised. For the designers, keeping this body form as natural and elegant as possible is paramount. We're pushing boundaries in terms of the design of the product because we've limited the number of what I would call, and, and there's known in the industry, as cut lines and shut lines on the car. So if, when you look at the 177, there is no bumper line that the whole front of the car is it's seen as one shape and one form. My favourite line is actually the line that comes off the top of the headlamp. It goes all the way down the side of the car, all the way around the back of the car and joins to the other side. And it's one single line that is both simple but complex at the same time. And that for me was a real achievement because it's a very, very difficult thing to do. With the desired body shape perfected and an increasingly inquisitive public restless for information, the designers have a full-size exterior-only plastic resin body of the car made. But how will the plastic replica of a million-pound car satisfy expectations? September 2008, Aston Martin decide that some classic British tailoring is required. If you think about the place where beautiful things are made from material, it's Savile Row. 
and that fit to the brand so well, so we had a Savile Row suit made for the car. While the car is having a suit fitting, world events seem to suggest that the bubble of bling has spectacularly burst. The collapse of Lehman Brothers Bank reverberates around the world. After the collapse of Bank Lehman Brothers, the uncertainty has intensified. In the September 2008, when Lehman went bust, we all discussed what, what will happen to the economy. We didn't know, nobody knew, and the policy makers didn't know. But Aston Martin's leader, Dr. Betts, remains focused on the 177's debut appearance and has selected the 2008 Paris Motor Show. Customers will be targeted, but of course the world press are ever present. And critics are asking if launching a supercar in this climate is a dangerous game to be playing. So what they're talking about is something that's five times more than an already expensive car that they make. To make a £1.2 million car, that takes a lot of guts. But Aston Martin aficionados believe they have a deeper reading of the situation. It's for a few. It's for uh, people who are obviously wealthy, but really want something very special in their life and something that other people don't have. It's a statement of sheer exclusivity with performance. It's cutting edge in its own way. Decision maker Dr. Betts isn't questioning his judgment. He hopes the 177 will inspire people. It should basically encourage also other people not only to think in the negative and only in a downturn and talk things down and talk things bad. Remaining upbeat and confident, Aston Martin is pushing ahead with their Paris press release. Paris is, is a great venue. I mean, it's uh, one of the capitals of style around the world. Being on a press day at Roadshow, there's no better place on earth to be. I think uh, motor shows come with a huge amount of expectation what's going to be the big star of the show. The car was there to show to potential customers, people who were willing to invest in the product before it actually existed. We were demonstrating that this was going to be something very special, very exclusive, but very typically an Aston Martin, but the ultimate Aston Martin that we could produce today. The 177, you know, I got the sense they were very confident about it. They display their confidence by infuriating the press. The Savile Row suit stunt they pulled at Paris was a big tease. It was, again, another example of a car manufacturer just giving you a little bit of information, whetting your appetite. The Paris show was interesting because Aston decided to reveal the 177. So when we got to the show stand, it's on the show stand, but it's got a bespoke cut of cloth covering the car, well, almost covering it. The front three-quarter, or a portion of the front three-quarters, was left uncovered. The biggest problem they had in that show was people trying to lift it up. Despite the, the problems with the economy, everyone was excited that Aston Martin were doing a car like this. They were shocked. Wow, we've never heard of that, and Aston Martin's never done this before. We can't wait to see it. And the other thing with the Paris show was that you saw this stunning shape. And I remember speaking to Marek and saying, is that, you know, is that ride height? Is that the way it will be? And he said, absolutely. Now the press has seen the concept car and in spite of economic gloom, the 177 begins to attract interest. At that time, we already had orders. People actually started putting down deposits, and we're not talking about five grand. The deposit on a 177 was a 200,000 pound commitment. You didn't get it back. For me then already, and, and you know, for, for Dr. Betts, it was like, yeah, people believe in this, and, and that was really important. With the first orders comes an additional request. The first customers, they have all chosen a specific number that they want to have on their chassis. Some of the first numbers to be snapped up are 7, 77, 1, and 21. But after that, the requests come for a more personal association. Generally, some people have, you know, one number that might be their birthday. Various parts of the world have different associations with different numbers. Number eight, for example, in China is a very important number. It's managed to cover most people, and, and a lot of people have got a very special number for their car. With the order books filling, the 177 now begins production in Dr. Betts's specially commissioned Micro Mega Factory. We assemble absolutely everything for 177 in here. So this is a small version of our larger factory. The main factory has a moving production line. Here, we, uh, we build each car on an individual station, in situ, so the car stays stationary. From the very beginning, the 177 is quite different from other Aston Martins. Where they all started with a lightweight aluminum top, the 177's top, or monocoque as it's known, 
is to be lighter still. This is the beginning of the process. We start with a carbon fibre monocoque, which is hand laid using Formula One technology. With race technology at its heart, this carbon fibre tub takes a total of six weeks to be hand laid. This technology is the pinnacle of lightweight engineering. The carbon fibre weave gives both enormous strength while being ultra light. Onto this high tech structure, the car's body panels are to be attached. To really appreciate just how incredibly unique the 177 is, it's worth comparing the next part of the assembly process with how Aston Martin make their high performance sports cars, like the Vantage, Virage, and the DB range. Here, back in the main factory, due to the higher number of cars produced, the emphasis is tailored to speed and precision. It's in the body in white assembly area that the pre-pressed panels have a specially formulated adhesive applied. With its roots in aerospace technology, this bonding adhesive is lighter and stronger than traditional welds. To help keep production up to speed, one of the only robots in the factory is used. It's affectionately known as the James Bonder. It can rapidly apply the exact amount of adhesive needed. Then once these panels are prepared, they're placed in a jig around the tub. All the body panels are then simultaneously attached, as Nick Lines explains. So what you can see in this facility here, the sides close almost like a Venus flytrap, and then the roof is loaded onto the vehicle, fitting the parts using pressure and heat to make sure they're correctly fitted to the vehicle. This ingenious method has absolute precision at its heart but the process for the 177 is very different. Aston Martin always wanted the 177 to be as handcrafted as possible, and this led them to look at their history. The 177 represents all that is good about the heritage of Aston Martin because it fuses together traditional craftsmanship with super modern technology. The examples of 177 where part of the tradition is around the handcrafted aluminium panels that are hand finished. We're taking sheets of aluminium, the guys are wheeling the panels, hand forming them, welding them together, linishing them, and creating this, this art, this form, this sculpture that is the skin of the car. The whole rear section of the car is formed from one continuous piece of aluminium. It begins as a series of smaller pieces that are hand molded and wheeled. Then each connecting piece needs to be brought together to be hand welded. Linishing, as it's known, is the art of smoothing out that weld until it's invisible. Each section of the car is handcrafted in this way. And we're really pushing the craftsmanship. Someone is able to take a flat sheet of aluminium and create these beautiful forms and shapes. And you look at it and think, how on earth did, did someone sculpt that shape out of metal? This method harks back to the way all Aston Martin's bodywork used to be made. Combining this traditional craftsmanship with the highly modern race-spec carbon fibre top points to the philosophy of the 177. Using that mixture of new and up-to-date modern technologies with the good old-fashioned engineering approach is to bring those two together to give a very, very different flavour to the car. And that's our interpretation of a supercar. In fact, throughout Aston Martin's history, their most successful years have been coupled with an active racing program. Today, Dr. Betts, along with the 177 chief engineer, Chris Porritt, enter many races, including the famous 24-hour endurance race at the Nürburgring. The fact that the company boss is still racing his own cars, I think that probably says a lot about the company, actually. One of their most important victories was winning the 1959 Le Mans. It was a key point in the company's history, marking them out as a British brand of excellence. David Brown reaps the rewards of his faith and the unflagging efforts of the men who built and drove the conquering Aston Martin. So when fictional British Secret Service operative James Bond needed a car, an Aston Martin was an obvious choice. In fact, the Aston Martin racing number today is 007, paying homage to the relationship that's now over 50 years old. Just as today, the race knowledge gained on the track in the 1950s and 60s was fed into their car development, 
which has helped to define their look. The vents in the side, well, that really goes back to the days of motorsport because uh, racing cars need to have uh, a reasonable amount of cooling under bonnet so that uh, there would be vents uh, put into the side of the front wings to allow air that went in through the radiator to come out somewhere. But the production models were never out-and-out -out race cars. They were Grand Tourers, or GTs as they're known in the automotive trade. Sports cars for the open road. A race car has um, one goal, and that is to win a race, um, ultimately. Road cars have to do a number of different things. So some similarities in, in raw performance, yes, but a lot of differences in that it needs to be a comfortable and nice place to be and therefore a pleasure to, to enjoy. The 177 needs to be part of that seductive history. So as stewards of the company, we have to build on our heritage and signal the direction of the future. It's the ultimate expression of what Aston Martin stands for in the last 94 years. Bringing that knowledge together requires exacting standards. Ultimately, because each panel is hand-formed, Every car is unique, and with this in mind, it's imperative that each part is not more than a millimetre out of alignment. It's here where the 177 is measured in over 600 places to make sure that while it stands as a one-off piece of craftsmanship, the whole car still adheres to all the correct tolerances. It's in the design studio where the interior starts to take shape. You generally create the outside first, so it leads the interior, but the interior is the bit that you spend all of your life in, in a car. It's an outside and an inside, but that's one holistic thing, and you can't look at one above the other. As with the exterior, it all starts with clay crafting, but there are many considerations that need to be taken into account. I love watching fabulous interior designers creating interiors. It's a special thing to see. They're thinking about so many complex issues, ergonomics, touch, feel, distances, the softness of leather, the smells, the tactility, driver information, all of those things. So it's a very, very complex area of design. Picking the right design line is essential. Combining flow and power is key. There's a very, very long, elegant dash, and the center console, very powerful, but again, the line is very graceful and very, very long. Once the correct line is chosen, then thought is given to the surface texture. So when you open the door, the threshold of the car, one of the really unique parts of a 177 is where you can see the sill structure, you can see that carbon fiber. So the weave has got to be perfect, where the carbon fiber joins together, and a lot of work had to go into making sure that there was no imperfections at all. Before any part, no matter how small, is dispatched to the 177 facility, every detail needs to be scrutinised. This is an order that comes from the very top. I personally want that all the details, the smallest screw and bolt, looks technically right. There are, I think, 120 plus inserts that sit in the carbon structure. They're machined to their specific shape. They're then also drilled to reduce weight as well. So they're just fantastic pieces that are never to be seen once the car's been assembled. All cars have surfaces you can see and surfaces that are hidden. Respectively, these are A and B surfaces. Commonly, those hidden from view, B surfaces are downgraded with a lesser quality finish and poorer materials, but not in this car. We've talked about every single aspect of the car. Only two days ago, um, there was a request to reroute part of the exhaust system. Someone said, it's OK, it's underneath the car. And I said, hold on a minute. I thought we agreed as a team that there were no underneath areas of this car. It's all a surface. You know, the team corrected itself. Yep, you're right, we need to think about that again. The team is, is a very tight team. And everybody's pushing each other to get the best possible solution for each of, their, each of their elements of the car, each of the systems within the car. So there's always some push, some flex, some tension, but ultimately, if you work together like that, you end up with the best product. Uniting together, the team stay committed to every surface being an A-surface. Everything is A-surface. Everything had to be beautiful, whether it was under the hood, even behind the dashboard, uh, in the boot, so everything wanted to look nice, and that's part of engineer's pride as well. The engineer's pride extends to the gold foil in the engine bay, which helps with heat management. But you won't see it unless you take the car apart. 
as Chris Porritt explains. Here we can see under the rear of the car, normally covered by the diffuser, is the structure of the exhaust system and the heat shield material that we need for the exhaust as well. We actually protect the rear of the car with gold foil here and here, and this is to protect the carbon structure. Here in the paint shop, our engineers remotely control the production process. All work takes place in a tightly air-controlled environment to minimise dust particles. We carefully apply seven layers of paint to each vehicle using a mixture of robotics and hand paint application. Each car is primed, then a base coat is added, then it's painted, any colour the future owner desires, after which a lacquer is applied, and finally it's polished, or detailed as it's called. But it's the setting sun that's the cue for the 177 to have its paintwork commence. The 177 is completely hand-painted, preferring to have the minimum number of people around. More of the car's artistic DNA can be added, with the customer's specific colour mixed and triple filtered before it's decanted into individual paint pots, ready to be applied. The final preparation of the bodywork is to remove the static electricity. Electrically charged particles are fired across the surface, neutralising the bodywork. This important step results in a body shell that will attract positively charged paint molecules to it, like a magnet. Now the automotive artists can begin their masterpiece. Once finished, the bodywork rests overnight in its dust-free climate-controlled booth. In the morning, the car will return to the 177 facility, where its engine is in the final stages of assembly. This is also the last opportunity to see some of the attention to detail that's gone into its creation. This is the powertrain sub-assembly area, where we assemble the engine to the front structure and ultimately to the transmission and drive line. So you can see the attention to detail in the machining on the cover the carbon fibre intake manifolds and cam covers. These are high up components in the car, so we wanted to make them out of a lightweight, very stiff material. Exhaust manifolds are covered when they're in the car with a heat shield, but they're hand formed and perfectly made for this car. Made from Inconel, which is a very expensive alloy used on Formula One exhaust, for example. Once the drivetrain is assembled and attached to the car, the engine is wheeled in to be connected to the main structure. This is where a 177 all comes together. We have four bays, one car to each bay. The car remains stationary through a build process. We have seven teams of guys that come along and do their specialist skills on each of the cars. As you can see now, the car has the engine, powertrain, all the front structure on the car, front suspension as well, and even the interior in it at this point. From the showing of the model at the Paris Motor Show, six months has now passed. And in car development terms, it's been a relatively quick process. The programme was such that we were running very, very fast. We had the first engine running within less than 12 months of actually thinking about the car. And the stakes are rising as the press are starting to get impatient. There's a lot of people in the industry that want to knock big, ambitious projects. When you put yourself on the pedestal to make a million pounds for Bullscar, the car has to deliver. The design has to be drop-dead gorgeous. The power has to be phenomenal, that every single stitch has to be perfect. The Paris Motor Show had just exacerbated some factions. When we previewed the car at the Paris Motor Show, there was a little bit of a tease, a bit of a reveal about the car. A lot of people were left slightly frustrated by the fact they hadn't seen under the skin of the cars. And I think that possibly was a bit too much of a tease. People wanted the hard facts right there and then. Geneva is targeted as the place to reveal all. Geneva is just about the world's most important motor show. All the world's automotive press are there. It's the perfect place to unveil an important new car. And Aston Martin know they'll be taking on the doubters. Not scary, but it's a little bit daunting because we're showing to the public, we're sort of almost laying ourselves bare and saying, you know, look, hey, we're, we're going to do this. Car manufacturers are famous for turning up with spurious concepts that never make reality. And a lot of people were beginning to say maybe 177 will never make reality. The market was beginning to get difficult. The difficult market is escalating and being felt at the centre of 177 production. 
some tough times in terms of the, the economic environment and, and how things were going in the economy, then we all had a passion and a belief that A, this was the right thing to do, and B, that we could do it. And we had to keep pushing with that. If you, if you falter, if you're not steadfast in your belief, then that's when the cracks start to appear. And Britain's bust banks are leading to devastating consequences for car producers. No car company or any other company really foresaw what will hit them. So the 2,000 job losses, 6,000 people were made redundant. Car companies have the problem that they're very receptive to very small springs in demand. Imagine you have suddenly parked hundreds of thousands of cars which you manufactured on the forecourt. You can't sell it. It was really bad, particularly for the luxury car manufacturers. With circumstances looking set to worsen, the 177 seems to belong to a different world. But rather than hold back, Aston Martin decide to bear all to the world. Geneva was a huge turning point in the statement from Aston Martin. It suddenly became real. We decided in Geneva to show a bare chassis and an exterior, but completely separate. So there was a chassis with the engine, the drivetrain, this carbon fiber tub, and then a separate body to one side. And this was the first time that people had seen everything to do with the car. UK journalists' response is unusually emphatic. The car looked amazing. Pretty much hits every beautiful button there is to hit. Technically extremely impressive. Look at the 177 in pictures, it's stunning. Look at it in real life and it is off the scale beautiful. It would seem that the press's response has vindicated Dr. Betts's determination and commitment. But critically, the exam question remains the same. What they needed was 77 individuals to go, I need one of those in my life. And that without being able to test drive one. As back at the 177 facility, they're still being put through their paces. After the build's complete, the car comes through here. And as you can see, this car's a little bit strange because it's covered in tape. That's because everyone is road tested and the tape's there to protect the paint surface. All Aston Martins are road tested to check for any faults wheel alignment carefully calibrated. Then they're all monsoon tested. Every Aston Martin takes a full final inspection, or audit as it's known. Now, this is the final audit process. It has a three altogether. On this one, it's the final details to make sure the car's immaculate for the customer. Once passed, there are two important seals of approval. First is a personal one from the inspector in the form of a plate mounted above the engine. Now, I would not say how many cars there are out there, but quite a lot of Aston Martins got my name on it, yeah. And finally, the wings are added, making it complete. For the 177, there is a further step. We have a presentation suite, so the plan will be that the customer comes, they're, they're sat down, the car will be behind closed doors. We have very, very elaborate lighting rig. As the door opens, and the customer's journey will end with this presentation of the car. The car world is an insane place. If you create enough of a desire for a product, people will buy it. It's finally when people get to feel the car and see the car and see the level of detail. Every single element of this car has been designed. It's as we first intended the car to be. So I think for me, that's the part that I would be most proud of. When the first car was, was ready to ship and we came down here and I had a lump in my throat, I'll be honest with you. It's the first time we've done a product of, of this nature. So it, it, we've learnt and we will grow from the engineering, we've learnt from the visuals. The 177 is very much about the future. If, it's, if, it, if this car will become a classic, we will see this in 10, 20, in 50 or in, in 100 years. At the moment, I see the beauty, I see the power, I see the soul, I see the craftsmanship, I, I, I see the piece of art. As I sit here now, they've sold most of them, considering how much it costs, that's an amazing feat. Not only have they made it, but they've made it to all the specifications they said they were going to make it to, which is very impressive. In the first year after it went to market, over 60 have been sold. And once the last one is purchased, the 177 facility will be decommissioned.
And just 45 miles away in Aston Clinton, the 177 drives the very same road where Lionel Martin triumphed nearly a century ago. It's a reminder that time is always the final judge. When iconic British Mark Aston Martin announces it's to create its first ever supercar, the world sits up and takes notice. Particularly as the car, the Aston Martin 177, promises to reach new levels of speed, design and price. It's the ultimate expression of what Aston Martin stands for. A project in fact so specialised that it even involves building the 177 its own mega factory. But Aston Martin is doing all this in the world's worst economic crash for 80 years. A meltdown that screams, the fun is over. This is a dramatic car creation story like no other. In 2007, Aston Martin, renowned for its understated English styling, handcrafted design, and for being James Bond's car of choice, commenced work on their most expensive production car. The cost, in excess of a million pounds sterling. The brief to build the ultimate Aston Martin. It's to be one of their most audacious decisions in their entire history. Just make the most irresistible Aston Martin. Mega factories with exclusive access follows Aston Martin over three years to compare how they take the production process to build their high-performance sports cars and push those standards to the limit as they make one of the world's most exclusive cars. We will look at how this supercar is created, from its conception to the very first thoughts of its design, 
We've never, ever taken a camera crew into here. Well, let's take a look inside. And how Aston Martin take little-known ancient disciplines of order and proportion. You can actually measure the proportion of something and people will find it attractive naturally. And weave them into every part of the car. We follow the complete journey of painstakingly sculpting and wielding the supercar. As well as building an engine that needs to be the most powerful of its kind ever produced. As if that challenge wasn't hard enough. Just a few months after announcing production, things become a lot tougher. Over 2,000 job losses, 6,000 people were made redundant. As the London Stock Exchange crashes and with it, the British economy. This was the moment when the world thought, wow, did we lose the capitalist system? We asked the question, in light of British-based Aston Martin's decision to make the world's most expensive production car, just as the UK enters the biggest depression in a generation, how can they possibly succeed? Warwickshire, in the heart of the English countryside, is the ultra-modern home of Aston Martin, where their high-performance sports cars are made, with evocative names such as Vantage, Virage and the DB range. Overseeing the Aston Martin empire is the enigmatic CEO, Dr. Betts. Holding a doctorate in engineering, he's well aware of what's needed to get results. In general, you can say my job, my task is a complete pleasure, but it's hard work. If you enjoy hard work, it's a great pleasure. There have been three key heads of the company in its history, but it's Dr. Betts who's overseen the most successful era to date. He's also a key member of the Aston Martin race team. A very sporty, it's very, very nice to drive. And it's in racing where the company's name originates. It is in fact the combination of the founder's name, Lionel Martin, and his first race victory up Aston Hill that were brought together to create Aston Martin. And it was Dr. Ulrich Betts who gave the order for the company to move from their old premises of 40 years to Warwickshire. The move is to their spectacular brand new mega factory based at Gaydon. In total, some 29,000 square feet, housing 1,400 employees. Each car is specifically built to order, taking typically 220 man-hours. But Dr. Ulrich Betts has even bigger ideas. In this building in 2007, he turns to his team and asks them to contemplate an Aston Martin supercar. Director of Design, Marek Reichmann, remembers it well. And Ulrich said to me, just make the most irresistible Aston Martin, something which is just, it, it is pure emotion. It's something that everyone would see and would just want to have. And as Aston Martin have a significant history to draw from, they aren't looking at a blank canvas. It stands for 94 years of history. It stands for all the, the, the passion uh, 